Hi, I'm Rod Anderson, and you're watching me today because you have requested and received 25 Orchard Faith of Jesus Bible reading guides, and you are ready to start number four. Now, number four today is dealing with what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't have these Bible reading guides and you'd like them, then all you have to do, and it's quite a simple thing, all you have to do is send me an email to info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au. That's info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au or go to our website, theorchardmelbourne.org.au and go to the tab mark, contact us, follow the prompts and we'll mail them out to you no matter where you live in the world and it is free of charge. Now, what we're going to do, and I've repeated this in the past, but what we're going to do is work through this study guide and uh, I want you to imagine that I'm sitting with you in your home and it's a one-on-one -on -one Bible study or it's a group Bible study. Now, there'll be some questions that I'm not going to be able to answer that you have. So again, I'd like you to go to our website and uh, when I receive those, questions then I can answer them in a proper way. Now remember at any time through this as well that you can press pause. So if you need to look up the Bible verse or write in answers, that is if I'm hurrying along and you find oh, he hasn't given me enough time to look up the Bible verse to read, then just press pause on your computer and uh, then you can restart it again. So there's no drama. The other thing is, and I've said it also before, if you can avoid using the index in the front of your Bible to find your way around the Bible, it'll be a great help to you because by the time we get to study number 10, you're going to be able to find your way around the Bible with ease from Genesis to Revelation while well, we're ready to start. Start our topic number four, what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. But before we do that, we ask for the Lord's blessing in order to illuminate our minds and we're going to just have prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you now that we have this opportunity to open your word, to study the Bible. And I pray for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit to rest upon us, that we will remember, that we will be encouraged and that we will be blessed as a result of this study today. And as we learn more about your word, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, let's go to our study guide, study guide number four, what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. Now, the subheading is the Holy Spirit's work. Question number one. What promise did Jesus make to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 15 to 18? Let's go there now. The book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the um, New Testament. And uh, now that we're up to number four, you must be moving along pretty quickly now, able to navigate your around, particularly around the earlier uh, uh, books in the New Testament. But we're going to John chapter 14 now, and we're looking at verses 15 to 18. John 14, verses 15 to 18. Right, I hope you're there. Press pause if you're not. Jesus says this. He says, if you love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. The question asks, what promise did Jesus make to his disciples? Jesus says here, I will pray to the Father and he will send you another helper. Who was the first helper? That's right, Jesus. Jesus was the first helper. So he will send another helper and then he says that he may abide with you forever. Well, so here we have this passage in which Jesus describes a helper who is to come, but he uses a personal pronoun. So let's answer this question. What promise did Jesus make to his disciples that he would send another helper or another comforter, uh, depending on what version you're actually reading from? Okay, question number two. Who is the comforter in the King James Version or the helper in the New King James Version? Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 26, where we find ourselves now. John 14, verse 26, and Jesus says this. 
But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So who is the Helper? Who is the Comforter? Well, the Helper, the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. So that's our answer there. The next subheading reads, the person of the Holy Spirit. Question number three. What are some of the tasks of the Holy Spirit? So we're staying in John, John chapter 15 and verse 26. So what are some of the tasks of the Holy Spirit? And in John 15 verse 26, we read this. But when the Helper comes, who I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of who? What does your Bible say? He will testify of me. So, here, what are some of the tasks of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. So there are times when I'm visiting families or when I'm at church and I'm speaking with my parishioners that uh, they'll say to me, you know, Pastor Rod, I felt that Jesus was very close to me uh, today or Jesus is very close to me or I had an experience during the week and I felt that Jesus was very near. Well, any time that experience happens in an individual life, it's just verifying the ministry of the Holy Spirit because this is precisely what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. He is meant to testify of Jesus, to give us an awareness of Jesus, to underscore the importance that uh, we need Jesus in our lives. Let's carry on now because we're looking at another text. It's found in John chapter 16 and verse 14. Now John 16 and verse 14. Again, speaking of the Holy Spirit, it says, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So what does it say there? He will glorify me. So who is the me there? Well, that's referring to Jesus. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus, to uplift Jesus in the world to us as individuals. Let's carry on. We're going to Book of Acts now. And remember, at any time, all you have to do is press the pause button to fill in your answers or to look up the Bible text and to um, identify where it is. Let's turn to Acts now. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts. Okay, who wrote the Acts, do you remember? Okay, it was Dr. Luke, and it covers the next 30 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's the, the, the work of the church that followed the ascension of Jesus Christ. So we're in Acts chapter 8, verse 29, and we read of this account with Philip. It says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot. Now, we won't bother about the background here. It's simply, simply to say this, that... The evangelist Philip is taken to a remote place and there is a man there that is the Holy Spirit wants Philip to be led to. So the Bible says that the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. In other words, the Holy Spirit directs us and it can happen in an audible fashion because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit speaks audibly to people at times. All right. So, what are some of the tasks of the Holy Spirit? To direct people, to guide people, uh, and also to testify of Jesus. Let's look at our next text now, and it's found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. As we allow the Bible to interpret itself, as we unpackage the wonderful truths relating to the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Here the Apostle Paul, the writer of the book of Romans, and the book of Romans was written probably around about 53 to 56 AD, 
Uh, that's about 34 years. Jesus was crucified in 31 AD, so probably about 25, something like that, years after the time of Christ's crucifixion. And we see here the, Paul, the, the Apostle Paul describing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says that the Holy Spirit prays or intercedes for us because we may have something that we want to pray about. We may believe that there's something highly important that we have to pray about. But God, who knows the end from the beginning, and because we know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, in other words, that he has all the omniscience, all the omnipresence, all the omnipotence that God the Father and God the Son equally have together the Holy Spirit also has that as well so um, the Holy Spirit knowing what we need as individuals in our lives he prays on our behalf for us isn't that wonderful to know it just shows you how much God cares for us all right question number four and remember as I said press pause if you don't have enough time to write your answers down but please write your answers down it's very important how is the Holy Spirit described? Again, we're going back to John chapter 16. Uh, so we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. John chapter 16 and verse 7. John 16 and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking here. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, you notice how Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit here. He uses personal pronouns. He talks about him. I will send him. And um, it says, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit is identified as a person here. Let's continue on. And we're looking at verse 13. It says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he speaks, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And then in verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So in other words, in, in this passages that we've read here, the Holy Spirit is certainly a person. It says the Holy Spirit receives from Jesus Christ and then he passes it on to us. He shares the knowledge of Jesus Christ with us. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that he testifies that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is important to our lives. So there's no question about it, just as we read passage, these passages here, that the Holy Spirit is a person with a character in every sense of the word. All right, let's carry on. Because we read that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Question number five. Upon what does the Holy Spirit work? We're reading from John again, and we're reading from verse 8 through to 11. John 8, sorry, John 16, and we're looking at verses 8 through to 11. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is, what does it say there? The ruler of this world is judged. So let's just analyze these verses that we've read here from uh, the Gospel of John. And remember, the Gospel of John is just focusing on really the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry uh, while he was alive on the earth. It says, uh, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's your advantage that I go. Verse 8, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. So one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of, of sin. As we study the Bible and as we reflect on the reality of life, we recognize that we all have a conscience, that inner moral law that guides us, that directs us. The, the, the inner moral law uh, checks us when we're doing or planning something that could, could be wrong or could possibly hurt someone. The Holy Spirit is the one who actually communicates to our Holy Spirit. And remember, there are basic 
fundamental truths and, and um, acts of behaviour that are fairly universal throughout the world. For example, if I go over to any country and I see a queue, just because I'm outside of Melbourne, outside of Australia, I can't go to the front of the queue, push people aside and go straight to the head of the queue. That's bad manners. Anybody anywhere knows that. I know that it's wrong wherever I go in the world to hit or slap a woman. I know that that is wrong. I know it's bad and wicked to abuse a child. I know it's, I know it's wrong. But how do I know it's wrong? And how is it when I go to di different parts of the world that those people there also know that it's wrong as well? Because we each have a conscience. You know, some have called it the inner moral law. I think it was um, C.S. Lewis who called it the inner moral law. Others have called it the, you know, the, the quiet voice of God. But n no matter what you call it, we actually see that the Holy Spirit convicts our conscience of what is right and what is wrong and guides us so that we can live in a community that functions in a coherent way and so that we as men and women know how to treat people uh, in a... In a in a kinder, in a gentler way than perhaps we other would at times. All right, let's continue on now. So upon what does the Holy Spirit work? Well, it works upon our conscience. All right, let's continue on now. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Now, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the, in the New Testament, Acts and Romans, the first book of the writings of Paul. And then we have, after Romans, we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Then we have Galatians. Then we have the book of Ephesians. So that's where we're going to go to now. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to past Corinthians, uh, past Ephesians. And I've gone a little bit too far, unfortunately. Now I'm in Ephesians and we're looking at verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. All right. And it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Now, what does the word grieve mean? It means to make sad. So here, the Apostle Paul says, Don't make the Holy Spirit sad. Well, how could we make the Holy Spirit sad? Well, by doing things that are wrong, by ignoring God, by hurting other people, by doing harm to property, whatever the case may be. We, we, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we refuse to respond to the Holy Spirit as He speaks to us, as He instructs us and guides us through the promptings and leadings upon our own conscience. But upon what does the Holy Spirit work? In answer to this question, it's just reinforcing that the Holy Spirit works upon your conscience and my conscience and every other person's conscience within the world. All right. So once you've got that, that answer down, let's go to question number six. How is a person alerted to their need of God? Let's go to 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians is just before Ephesians, it's just before Galatians. And we're going to 1 Corinthians. We're looking at chapter 2 and verse 10 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. Do you remember who the writer of uh, the book of Corinthians was? Yeah, the Apostle Paul. Let's carry on now. Chapter 2, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Let's think about this answer here. Because the question is actually asked, how is a person alerted to the need of God? Well, again, it's through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals to us our need. In this life, there are certain things that we can pursue. And once we have them... You know, we start thinking about other things because it just doesn't satisfy. But it's in those times of reflection when we're looking at the shallowness of the Word that the Holy Spirit reminds us of God, that in God we have something solid, we have somebody solid, that we have someone who can bring hope and purpose to our lives. And instead of grasping and, and coveting everything and everyone that can come into our reach, we become settled, we become content, we become happy in our own skin 
because we've responded to the Holy Spirit who has highlighted to us the importance of God in our lives. And as we respond to that invitation, then it's amazing how we have this sense of ease. The anxieties of life seem to disappear. You know, that unexplained anxiety that people often had in, in, in their lives, you know, that disappears. Why? because we are cooperating with God. And it's God who brings this sense of unease so that we will turn to him, so that we acknowledge him. So whatever you do, if, if you've experienced that, don't try and blanket it with drugs or don't try and blanket it out with alcohol or, or um, other uh, uh, behaviour that, that can harm you or harm other people. Don't do that at all. You know, God has placed that within us in order that we would seek him out, that we'd search him out in order to have a fuller and more complete life. All right, let's carry on. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is question seven. How do we know the scripture or Bible prophecy is not man-made? Good question. How do we know that this book here isn't the same as yesterday's newspaper or Encyclopedia Britannica or the writings of Milton? Well, let's find out. Let's go to 2 Peter. Remember, an easy way to find First and Second Peter, to find First John, Second John, Third John, those small little epistles, is to go to the Book of Revelation and then just flick back a few pages because you'll find that you'll come across First and Second John, Third John. You'll see Peter. So here we are in First Peter, near the end of our Bible. Actually, we have to go to Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter one and verse twenty and twenty-one. And here we read this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The question asks, how do we know the Scripture or the Bible is not man-made? How do we know? Because it's inspired by by God. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And within the Bible, we find real prophecies that are easy to understand and easy to explain as well. All right. So how do we know? Because the Bible is inspired by God and prophecy is the evidence of that. Well, we're continuing on now. Press pause if you feel as I'm moving ahead too quickly. But we're going to question eight. Who gives us our abilities, or another way to put that, our gifts, our talents, to serve God? So where do these come from? In fact, who is it that gives us our abilities and our gifts in the first place? Well, let's turn now to 1 Corinthians. Now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans, and then we have 1 Corinthians. So we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're looking at verses 7 through to 11 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to start reading from verse 7. All right. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one... Ah, oh, let me stop for a moment. It says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit at all, of all. So in other words... When you recognize in somebody else that God has blessed them with a particular talent, a particular ability, it's not so these people can exalt themselves and say, aren't I wonderful or I've gained the favor of God. No, no, no. The Bible says here, the Apostle Paul reiterates that it's for the benefit of all. So if I have an ability or, an, or a gift, it's not for me to covet. It's not for me to boast about. It's for me to use in order that others will be benefited at the same time. So let's carry on now. Verse 7. Here we read. For, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another differing, different kinds of, of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. Now, what are the last three words there? As He wills. 
So who is it who determines who gets what gift? That's right. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who determines that that person gets that gift or that person gets a, a number of gifts. That person gets that gift. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's he who chooses. So that's our answer there for question number eight. It's the Holy Spirit who determines who gets what gift. Now, as we reflect on question number eight here, you, it's not a big mental leap to realise that the, act, the Holy Spirit actually has free choice in determining who gets what gift. That means that he is autonomous to a certain extent. Well, he is autonomous. He's his own free will. He, has, he is his own person. He chooses who gets what gift, as the Bible says. And that ability to choose or choice uh, reflects true personality. And personality can only come or originates with a person. And the Holy Spirit is a person in every sense of the world. Okay, how do we know that the Holy Spirit was active in Old Testament times? This is question number nine. Now, this is a very important question because a lot of people will say that the Holy Spirit has only been active since the time of Jesus. But we're going to see shortly that that is absolutely false. Let's go now to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, we've never been here before, have we? No, not in these studies either. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the start of the Bible. We go to Genesis. And then we're just going to flick through Genesis to Exodus. And we go through the first five books of the Bibles, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then we're going to get to Joshua. And then comes Judges. But then following Judges, we have the book of Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel. But we're reading from 1st Samuel here and uh, chapter 16 and verse 14. 1st Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now Saul was the first king of Israel. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit uh, from the Lord troubled him. Now, this is one of those verses that challenges many people. And they say, does this mean that the Lord is the one who actually sent this horrible spirit to harass and torment um, uh, Saul, King Saul? It doesn't actually mean that. What we have to understand is this, that when a person intentionally turns away from God, what they, they become vulnerable then to the attacks of Satan. When we're attempting to connect ourselves with God, when we're attempting to walk in the light as, as far as we know uh, from the instruction of God's word, in those cases, to a certain extent, God protects us. But when a person turns their backs on God and says, no, nope, I'm not having anything to do with you, you know, I'm going to edit God out of my life, then they become susceptible and vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. After all, if we believe in God, if we believe there is a spirit world and the Bible identifies the devil as the, um, uh, the, the chief protagonist, if you like, in this great controversy between Christ and Satan, then certainly we have to believe that Satan is real, that he's a real being and not to be confused by the Hollywood imagery of something with horns and tail and and, uh, and the like, because uh, that's a load of nonsense. And in fact, the Bible actually describes Satan as a fallen angel who once upon a time was beautiful in appearance. But we're going to look at that at another time. Anyway, back to this. When a person turns their back on God, they become vulnerable to Satan's attack. And so this is all that's, that's happening here. Saul has turned his back on God and he's grieved the Holy Spirit. And because of his continued rebellion, what has happened? He's walked away from God and now he's made himself susceptible to the, to, uh, the deceptions of Satan and a foul spirit. That's what we see happening here. So we see certainly that the New Te in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is there. Let's go to another one. This is in the book of Psalms, right in the middle of the Bible. No explanation needed here any longer. We're going to Psalms chapter 51. And we're looking at verse 11. And here we read this. This is after King David's sin, his great sin. This is when 
he had that um, adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and then he orchestrated the murder of Uriah the Hittite, uh, her husband, and after a period of, well, probably 12 months, while he was trying to hide the sin, conceal the sin, finally he, he, he is exposed by um, a prophet and uh, one of God's prophets. And it actually says that in the Bible that David confesses his sin. But what happens after that, he prays to God. And notice these words here in verse 11. King David, and this is written about 1050 BC, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You see, from this passage here, we read that the Holy Spirit was pivotal in the role of salvation. And King David pleads, please do not rem remove your Holy Spirit from me. Let's carry on. Because our next text is found in the book of I Isaiah. Now, we're very familiar where the book of Isaiah is because we've spoken about this many times in this uh, series of studies. And yes, I know that we're only up to number four at this point in time, but even so, we've referred there and gone there a number of times. So we're going to Isaiah chapter 64, or 63 rather, and we're looking at verse 10. And here, in the book of Isaiah, it says this, but they, referring to Israel of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them, it says there. What did the people of Israel do? They grieved the Holy Spirit. They turned their backs on the Holy Spirit and then they exposed themselves to all sorts of problems. We won't go into any detail now in relation to that, but just simply to say this, that we can see from the verses that we've looked at that the Holy Spirit was very active and um, pivotal in the role of salvation, even in Old Testament times. Let's move on now because we're going to question number 10. Question number 10 says, what are the results when a person responds to the Holy Spirit? How will we know that a person is actually responding to the Holy Spirit that uh, is communicating to their conscience? How do we know that a person is being true to the inner moral law within them as the Holy Spirit prompts them and guides them? Well, let's go to Galatians. Now, we're going to the New Testament now for Galatians. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then we have the book that was written by the Apostle Paul, Galatians. So we're going to Galatians now. And Galatians chapter 5 is the text under question. Galatians chapter 5. And <clears throat> we're looking at verses 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says this. But the fruit of the Spirit, or the evidence of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. In other words, all that means is that the law, that is the Ten Commandments, does not, commit, con, does not, um, does not condemn love, joy peace, long-suffering. And that's obvious, but sometimes the Bible has to state the obvious to people. Verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desire. If we live in the Spirit, <clears throat> let us also walk in the Spirit. So <clears throat> what are the fruits of the Spirit here? Well, love, joy, long-suffering, self-control, gentleness, these sort of things. So this is our answer for question number 10, our final question. Now we move on in our study and we're at the summary section. So summarize the personal attributes of the Holy Spirit. So from the study we've done, from the verses we've looked at, what, how would you summarize the personal uh, attributes of the Holy Spirit? Well, if it was me, I would be saying the Holy Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit guides us, leads us, 
the Holy Spirit can be hurt. And we know when the Holy Spirit hurts because we sense um, um, uh, that within us, within our inner moral being. So uh, these are some of the things that you could put there for your answer if you so desire, or something totally different. <clears throat> Let's look at the reflection question. So how does what I've learned now apply to me today? All right. So why should we be obedient to our consciences? Well, think about it, and you probably already have. If we're responding to our conscience, that inner moral law, that means we're responding to the Holy Spirit. As a result of that, we are responding to God. So the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is communicating with us and is communicating us the will of Jesus Christ, the will of God the Father. So as we respond to our conscience, we are doing God's will. That's our answer today. Question number two. Identify the benefits of the Holy Spirit to us. Well, reflecting on this question here, you could say that the Holy Spirit gives us insights as we study the Bible. Instead of just viewing the Bible as unimportant because the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, we now can understand more of what the Bible teaches because we are being illuminated by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also convicts us and reminds us that God does exist himself and that there are certain things that God does expect of us. That the Bible, we read this passage earlier, where the Bible warns us about sin, that the Holy Spirit convicts us that there will be a judgment to come, that men and women are going to be accountable for the lives that they live today. So you can use any of those uh, answers there that I've given, or you can use them all, or something that you've thought of yourself, because this is real, this reflection section is about how what I've learned now applies to me today. Let's go to the resolution section now. I believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead who guides me in the paths of righteousness. I want to submit to his leading. So if that's your desire, place your name there and then sign off. It's just the same as being in church, as I've said before, where you put your name out when, for example, if I'm preaching, I'll ask, did that make sense? Or I'll ask if, if you'd like to respond to the invitation of Christ come forward, those sort of things. It's exactly the same thing. You're doing it by uh, being at home, in your study, in your lounge room, wherever you find yourself, on the train, on the bus, wherever you are, at, at, at the office place at lunchtime, you can actually do these and uh, sign off um, at the same time. All right, additional study. This is, remember, this is the meat. This is the additional information that puts flesh to the study. We've got an idea about the Holy Spirit, but now we're going to learn more. And it says this, our privilege. It is our privilege to have a sense of peace and joy in our lives as we obediently respond to the Holy Spirit's leading, gathering and applying the lights of God's word into our own lives. Righteousness means right doing, and we can only be deemed righteous if we are living up to all the light God has given us in his word. The desire to be obedient, once prompted by the Holy Spirit, stems from our love for and our faith in Jesus Christ. It is then, as we realize we are cooperating with heaven's agencies, that the peace that passes all understanding fills our entire being with God's love. Now, as I've said before, as we read through this, in a normal situation where I'm doing Bible studies in a home or if I'm doing studies in a group, then I get different people to read. But in this situation, I have to do all the reading. So I hope that um, my monotone uh, doesn't uh, put you to sleep. But um, try and stay awake. P pinch yourself if you need to. All right, let's keep going. Joy in the world. In the world, some pleasures and entertainment come from sources which the Bible positively frowns upon. Nonetheless, the followers of Jesus Christ can experience happiness, joy, satisfaction and pleasure. They can still be driven and ambitious for success in their lives, all the while living in the expectation of their Saviour's return by cooperating with heaven's planned purposes and promises for them. God desires to answer our prayers and gives us and give us good things. But there are conditions. First, 
is our willingness to allow the Holy Spirit, I'll say that again, first, is our willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to lead in our lives and two, that each of us remain sensitive to his promptings. God the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a divine person who is eternal, possessing all the attributes and personality and deity, including intellect, emotions, eternality, omnipresence, omniscience and omnipotence and truthfulness. The Holy Spirit's role in salvation. The Holy Spirit, also known as the Holy Ghost, the Comforter or the Helper, is equal with God the Father and God the Son. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to execute His divine will in relation to all mankind. We recognize His sovereignty, His sovereign activity in creation, the incarnation, the written revelation of God's word through the prophets and the work of salvation for mankind. The Holy Spirit throughout the Bible. Many teach that the work of the Holy Spirit began at Pentecost, around 31 AD when he came from heaven as pr promised by Jesus Christ to initiate and complete the building of the body of Christ which is his church. Broadly speaking, the Holy Spirit's divine activities include convicting the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and transforming believers into the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit and the Old Testament. Nonetheless, as we study the Old Testament, we learn that the Holy Spirit was there prior to the creation of our world. He was ignored by men and women before the time of the Great Flood. The Holy Spirit's power was clearly seen in the life of Joseph. The Holy Spirit gave spiritual gifts and practical abilities to men and women. Men and women received the gift of prophecy through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the Seven Virtues. The Holy Spirit spoke to people. People knew the importance of the Holy Spirit in relation to salvation and they knew there was no place to escape the promptings and leadings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was also understood to give seven virtues to men and women. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. And that word fear there by the word, it's just the old English word for revere, to reverence. So fear or reverence of the Lord and a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. These gifts were understood to be spread among God's people. The person of the Holy Spirit. One Christian writer has said this, The Holy Spirit also always leads to the written word. The Holy Spirit is a person, for he bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times, we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. What strong evidence of the power of truth we can give to the believers and unbelievers when we, when we can voice the words of John. We have known and believed that the love that God has given hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. The Holy Spirit has personality, or else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person, or else he could not search out the secret secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God and also in the mind of mankind. Summary. God the Holy Spirit was active with the Father, the Son in the creation of this world, along with the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the redemption of mankind. He inspired the writers of Scripture. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings and those who respond. He renews and transforms into the image of God. The Holy Spirit, or the Comforter, was sent by the by the Father and the Son to be with his children to the end of the age. He extends spiritual gifts to the church, empowers it to bear witness to Christ and in harmony with the Bible he leads people into all truth. Final illustration. Sometimes back the Associated Press carried a story regarding a man from the city of Glasgow, not Scotland, but in the state of Kentucky, the United States. In it, the article reports that a man by the name of Leslie Puckett, after struggling to start his car, lifted the hood and discovered that someone had stolen the motor. 
That is a great illustration of a person who ignores the Holy Spirit. They are spiritually blind, devoid of spiritual sensibilities and just destitute of a living faith. The person of the Holy Spirit is essential for our salvation and for our spiritual drive. Amen. Well, that's the conclusion of our study. Now this is the end of study number four, what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue on next time in study number five. But uh, as is our custom, uh, we are to close in prayer. But before we do that, I just want to remind you, if you don't have the study guides, you can go to the address, which is now on the screen, and uh, order them through the website there and we will send them out to you wherever you live in the world and they are absolutely free of charge but you will need a bible to um to really get the most from these studies all right then well thank you very much for uh participating in the study and why don't we just bow our heads for prayer now Father in heaven, you are merciful and a good God. We thank you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the way that he moves upon us, guides us, directs us, protects us, helps us to know what is right and what is wrong. We thank you for your continued ministry, and we thank you, Father, particularly for our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who makes life worth the, worth the living. And I'd ask that for each one of our viewers, for those who are listening on the radio, for those people wherever they are in the world, as they reflect on these studies, particularly this one tonight, that they would be encouraged and blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you next time.